All right, well, welcome everybody. My name is Sarah Gladu. I'm the Director of Education and Citizen Science for Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust. And we're very pleased this afternoon to bring Alicia Black, uh, Maine Forest Service, uh, with us today, talk about what she does and tell us about the Forest Service. I feel like sometimes being on the coast, I'm sort of separated from a lot of what's going on in Maine where we have so much forest and we sometimes, I feel like on the coast, we don't fully recognize that. Um, but uh, we're really pleased to have Alicia join us and talk about all the all the different projects that she works on and, and what she does. So um, I will say a couple of housekeeping things, which is I will ask everyone to go ahead and mute themselves at this point. And um, if you would like to ask a question, Alicia has said it's fine to put it in the chat or um, if you'd like to um, ask it right then in the middle of the, of the conversation, that's fine. You can either literally put up your hand or put up your hand virtually and we'll try to keep an eye on things so that we see when someone's hand is up and we're happy to call on folks and um and then you can ask your question make your comment and um i am recording this program we've actually had some interest from some teachers who wanted to be able to show this to students so i'm excited to be able to offer that it is one of the benefits of zoom and I think with that, we'll let Alicia take it away. Thank you so much for being with us, Alicia. Really appreciate it. You'll have to unmute yourself though. <laughs> I know. The Three times. times, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was asked to come and speak about my job, which I take a lot of pride in and really enjoy. So I'm happy to share with you guys and we will keep it informal. So if I'm talking about something that you have a question about, go ahead and chime in and I'm going to do my best here to get this going quickly and share my screen. And work on the audio, which will just take a second. Okay, this should work. Let me know if you don't hear it. We're a law enforcement agency. We also fight fire, which is our main mission. And we have opportunities to travel out of state. Best days I have at work when I get to help people in the state of Maine, if we're rescuing somebody with a short haul. Our office varies day to day. It could be in a field, could be in the woods, could be in our truck. I love my job. Every day could bring a different challenge. Whatever comes across my plate is what I do that day. Being a ranger is a great job. If you're looking for a great career, contact us today. Nope, there we go, okay. So I just wanted to kind of jump into what I do um, and starting with some of the law enforcement work. I, and I think when we, while we're talking, if you guys, if anybody knows anybody who's looking for a job, if you have any of those type of questions that I can clarify to like, feel free. Um, so some of our law enforcement uh, roles and responsibilities include timber harvesting, which is a really great part of my job where I get to go walk people's private property and keep it, keep it safe with making sure that their boundary lines are being protected, that there's no timber trespass happening, uh, which is when a harvest is being conducted, making sure that the abutting landowners, that there's a way to see where the boundary lines are and that those are being respected. So protecting those folks that aren't even having a harvest done at that time. Uh, one of our more glamorous jobs is uh, going through litter and trash and making sure that we can keep access to private lands open by helping folks that are having these issues and people just dumping garbage or leaving couches, furniture, things like that. I, I was talking to some rangers about like what they really take a lot of pride in. And this was, this was surprisingly one of those things, even though it's kind of gross and uh, you see some things you don't want to, you get to help uh, private landowners. Uh, when we talk about some of the environmental protection laws that we handle, we work in air quality, which is why those the burning laws prohibit anything other than wood being burned. That has everything to do with the breathing and air quality in the state of Maine. So this is just a nice picture of a burned chair. 
we work with water quality. So when we're doing our harvest inspections, sometimes they're near bodies of water. And this is actually from the Duck Trap River in Lincolnville. I was here last fall, I believe it was. And if you see that middle picture, there's a, that's where the skid trail was. And it went directly into the picture on the right, which is the water coming right off of the skid trail down into, and you can see the duck trap on that left-hand picture out in the background. So just making sure that we're catching these things and getting them fixed before they create larger problems in salmon habitat or any other pr protected water body. This, uh, this is shoreland uh, statewide standards maps. So each town has, or most towns have uh, maps that I, I can help facilitate with the harvester and make sure they understand them. And you can actually Im import these onto a phone or a tablet or some kind of device. They're all on the main forest service website. Um, and then you, folks are very keen on where they are on that map, which is helpful for those buffer zones and no harvesting allowed or whatever the restrictions are. Uh, one of the cool aspects of the job is determining cause of wildfires. So this was one in Somerville last year and it started and there was, uh, there was a, a, about 0.2 acres on fire in Somerville and we were looking for the cause and I, I followed it down. I could smell something burning. And as I went into the woods, I found where this barbed wire was down in the ground and had caught fire and there was another little section I followed it down, we found two more. This first picture on the left had actually put itself out, but that one, that second one was separate from the fire that we initially got called to. And it was a lightning strike and a lady across the street had actually called it in because she had observed lightning and heard a huge crash and it happened right there. So that was a neat one. We are an arms law enforcement agency. All of our newer hires are going to the uh, basic law enforcement training program at the uh, Criminal Justice Association, uh, Criminal Justice Academy, excuse me. So anybody who's already has a law enforcement uh, blue pin from the academy can transfer over to us and then new folks are going through the academy. We work a lot uh, with fire departments. So local fire departments, volunteer fire departments, full-time fire departments. We assist in training folks. Uh, we have a uh, national wild, uh, wildfire has a whole curriculum for folks working in wildland fire. So we put on some initial classes for even just volunteer folks that, you know, might be school teachers in the winter and spring and want to do something else in the summer or, uh, folks that just have jobs where they can get away for a couple of weeks. So you probably have seen on the news where Maine sends out an engine or Maine sends out a crew. And these are the folks that we have trained. It's not all forest rangers that go on these assignments. These are folks that we train up in, in different qualifications that we take with us working for the state of Maine at that point and then sent to um, wherever the need is. We work uh, with all kinds of equipment uh, we have UTVs and ATVs, pumps, uh, obviously the, I, th I think I have a picture of a pump in here, uh, but high pressure pumps that bring water from wherever to wherever. We can pump water a mile from, from, the, uh, from the source, which is pretty neat when you learn all that hydraulic work. Um, we have skitters, dozers, boats, ATVs, UTVs, uh, and fire engines, and that's in Hemet's, these gigantic federal excess equipment trucks that haul, uh, I think it's a thousand gallons on that one, but tons of water into remote areas because rangers that work in the unorganized territories are the first responders on a fire. So whenever there is not a volunteer fire department, uh, the forest ranger covering that area is first on scene and has, the, has control of the situation and the fire, calling in all resources needed and making sure everybody gets paid. That's part of what we do in the state. Um, where we are here, most everything except Hibbert Score, and then some of the islands are um, organized. So those have fire departments that usually take, take control of the situation. And if they need assistance, we step in and help them. It's just a video of just what we do with our equipment maintenance. Um, and let me see here.
that's actually a volume pump, not one of the high pressure pumps that we talked about just to fill up that tank. And one of the big focuses of what we do is making sure all equipment's ready to go at all times because when it when you need it, it has to work. It's like technology. We're moving on. Okay. So I think if you folks read the news, there was a really large wildfire for, for this area in Waldeboro this summer. And um, the, initially I got called by Waldeboro Fire to help find it. We were hiking all around this spot and we wasn't seeing it. There was just some smoke that had settled down in this drainage area. And it was getting closer to, uh, closer to four o'clock. And so I called the helicopter to come up and take an aerial. And he said, are you there? Cause it's pretty big. And I said, I do not know where you are. And so our folks in the helicopter, our pilot uh, was able to locate it, get us in there so they can see, we have numbers on our trucks and so they can tell us driving down the road and was able to talk me into it. And then he put this bucket on the bottom of the helicopter and dumped water on it for uh, about 45 minutes and knocked the head of the fire down. So that's a Huey right there. They're Vietnam era helicopters. Bell UH-1H. We have a 407 in the Jet Ranger, and we're getting some new aircraft too that they let that uh, just passed the budget. So that you do get to work a lot with aircraft, especially if you are on the short haul team, which I get to do, which is a real honor. We we work and train uh, every two weeks, and we work on a static line underneath the helicopter, and we're inserted in to uh, help with rescues. So if somebody's on the top of a mountain with a broken leg and we look at all of the risks uh, associated with that, if, if it's going to take 30, 40 people to get them down the mountain and it's cold and it's raining and it's slippery, it makes more, more sense for the main forest service to fly and go help that person than it would to put 40 other people in danger. So we do risk assessments, but um, the short haul program is one of the things that we are allowed to do as there's a bunch of different facets of, of the job and there are a lot of specialties that kind of go with it. And this is one of them. We do some prescribed burning and uh, kind of really try to talk to land managers about using it as a tool and what the uses are and uh, giving, giving some ideas on how they can get the resources they need and um, helping to kind of talk through how to use fire. This is us using prescribed fire on the railroad. We also work with the, the folks that run the railroad. So like Pan Am or the state of Maine, uh, making sure that anything within that right of way is not going to be flammable. So we, we do some proactive prescribed burning uh, and we do inspections on the railway. Just there used to be a ton more incidents of railroad fires when uh, brake pads were more of an issue and spark arresters weren't as kept up, but we, we've, been, we've been seeing more compliance lately. Uh, this is, so this is some uh, prescribed burning that I did with uh, the Brunswick Topsum Land Trust. And this was uh, just this spring and it actually got so hot that it registered with NOAA up, up in the sky on their satellite. And that's an extreme example. It's a, it's a fire whirl that started, we were uh, bringing laterals, um, we were bringing strip fires away from the, the fire that was going slowly to kind of push it to go together. And it created just this perfect vortex and stood right up and then it kind of jumped over the line and went for a little run and everybody was safe and we took care of it. Uh, but it's just, it's a, it's an, keeps you on your toes and you gotta be paying attention at all times, but it's, it's a great way we got uh, 13 acres of blueberry burned really, really well, uh, complete consumption through there, which was awesome and exactly what we needed. And again, okay. The other part of what we do, and this, this is probably of interest to a lot, oh, whoops, sorry. A lot of folks is uh, working with landowners in their home ignition zones. We'll come in and do communities. There's a, a project that, um, one of our specialists works on and he, he gets volunteers. And we also have an internship through the, through the state. Um, we have, we take 
three college students and they'll come in and, and work on this project and then some other projects within, but it gives them a taste for what the Forest Service does. But part of this is we have a chipping program. We have a, a huge industrial wood chipper and we can work with communities. And if they're willing to proceed with the recommendations that are written by uh, the, the plan, then folks, they'll, they'll bring in the wood chipper and like run through a community and take all your brush and get rid of it for you. Uh, there are some restrictions as to who's eligible and, and uh, what communities are eligible, but it's a, it's a real program. But this also, I mean, we'll do this for anybody, any forest ranger in the state will, will come over and look at your house and talk to you about home ignition zones. If you look here, this, uh, let's see here, the bottom right is McGunnacook. Um, it's, it's really pretty landscaping. But those softwoods that are right up against the, the porch in the house are really, they're like candle wicks when it comes to bringing fire from the woods in towards the house. And pretty easy to ignite a home when, when they're right up against it and the porch. Um, the, let's see, the Shoal Cove. So that's on the bottom left-hand side. And that's wooden, wooden cedar shake sh shingles, which is a, is a very difficult thing to get fire out of once it starts. I mean, they can, little embers get caught in there and then all it is is wood. So it, it'll burn up pretty easily. This is a minimal defensible space. And then they've got that wood debris. You can see right up against that house, all that lumber. So like that's, that's problematic. Um, the one up top isn't, isn't as bad, especially they have, you can see, I mean, the leaves right up against the, the house, but they've put in that rock all around the foundation to stop anything from advancing up. It's probably a drip edge, but also it stops any fire from advancing right up and into the vinyl siding. Um, and it's got green all the way across to the, and it, what I guess it is, is that uh, that piece of forest right there is actually the boundary line. So they've done their best to uh, maintain good defensible space around their home. So that's, that's something like we really get engaged with the community in. Um, the mobilizations that I kind of discussed earlier, we train the crews and take them uh, all over the place. This one's in California, this one on the right. It was pretty cool. Um, we, we push a lot of water. We use water on fires in the state of Maine and obviously out West, they don't always have that opportunity. So when pump shows have to happen, pump, we call them pump shows. So pumps off an engine or running in tandem with another pressure pump further down the line, that's something we get to use often in the state. And when you go out West, um, we're kind of considered experts and they'll call us over. Hey, Maine, you guys work with fire. Or you guys work with water. Excuse me. Can you, can you get this rigged up and get it, you know, thousand feet down there? And that's, that's always, that's a pretty good honor to, to be known for that. Um, so this one's California on the right and the center and the left, actually, I think those are all California pictures, but you know, we get to see other parts of the country. We get to work with all kinds of different crews, whether they're hand crews, hotshot crews, um, other okay. engines or, um, we, I think I have a picture, I'm not sure, but part of that home ignition zone piece that I just discussed, we have, you'll go in and assess camps uh, or areas that are ahead of the fire that, you know, can we save them? Can we, can we help, you know, mitigate some of these um, fuels that are coming right up to the house and, and creating this dangerous area for these, these um, vacated homes? Um, let me see what's next. Oh, we, so the diversity of assignments that we have, uh, we'll run saws on uh, just clearing trails, making sure that fire engines can get in and out of places. Uh, we'll fill those, that orange thing on the ground there is called a pumpkin in the middle picture. And sometimes we'll just run water shuttles to make sure that there's a water supply constant in, in whatever's needed. And sometimes we see little dinosaurs out in the woods. Um, we have incident management. We have a type three incident management team right now, a short team, and they just went out this year. Um, I believe it was Idaho. I'm not, I'm not hundred percent on that, but we, in the past, we've sent folks to hurricane Sandy and other responses um, in the incident management capacity of logistics, finance, operations, and planning, which really it's just uh, organizers of chaos. So whenever, a bigger incident is happening. You always need people to be able to organize it and give people certain, certain specific tasks to do. And that's, that's what, what we kind of specialize in in the Forest Service. Everybody, once you start, picks a track of how they want their, uh, their career to proceed and 
we all start in operations and then kind of find our niche after that. So that's incident management. Uh, we have a drone team now. Uh, they are licensed pilots and they can, we had, I was talking to my, my uh, workmate and he had, he couldn't find where this uh, muddied water was coming from and took his drone up and was able to uh, chase it right back to a harvest that was happening a, a mile away and uh, was able to take care of it from there. So it's, it's a newer opportunity. I think it started last year, maybe two years ago, but they've found some great uses for it so far. Um, just, and I just threw some other things in here that, that we all kind of partake in and, and people pick their specifics. Like I am on the short haul, the weather committee, which is how I met Sarah and uh, putting out um, really cool rain wise weather stations that now talk to a national database. So we are keeping historical weather data for all future purposes, which is awesome. Um, prescribed fire and you know, all, all of these things are opportunities for any new ranger. So it's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, that is what I have. So really it's about questions now. <laughs> Anybody want me to go back to anything? That's great, Alicia. I really appreciate sort of a big overview there. Yeah, I'm curious. Folks are welcome to put their um, questions right in the chat box if they prefer, or if you just want to raise your hand uh, in whatever fashion you wish, or just speak up. I, I have a question. Um, when you talked about getting rid of um, trees, that are close to houses, et cetera. Yet we're also hearing in places where flooding and um, development happens, how do we find the balance between vegetation and trees in, as, a, as a, an absorber and a holder of water and preventer of erosion, and yet also not a fire hazard? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, when, when any kind of shrubbery or trees are close in the proximity of that like 30 foot zone that I showed on that slide. If you can trim them up so that, I mean, it's, we're not gonna, if we have a significant crowning fire, which is when the top of the trees are burning and that is what's actually carrying the fire. If we're having a crowning fire, your house is, is going to be lost anyway. And we haven't had one of those in the state in, I think it's been 20 years, which it doesn't mean it won't happen because it, it will. But right now, that's that's not the main carrier of fire. Fire is is down is down low usually. So if you can remove the branches and anything that is within like that six foot range, six to eight feet that um, that would carry it towards your structure, that's that's your best bet. And then you can leave your trees. Great, that thank you. Okay. There's another question in the chat. Um, uh, it looks like Deborah's asking, what is short haul? What does that mean? So short haul is, is that picture I showed of the helicopter with the static line. So that rope that hangs underneath it. I wear a harness and a helmet and I clip in with a carabiner onto the bottom of that line and I get flown. There's a crew chief that sits in the back of the helicopter and they talk to the pilot and they're, they're leaned out and watching me the entire time. And they talk to the pilot about distance and direction. So I, we all do the same thing. So crew chiefs are short haulers and short haulers are crew chiefs. So we can each sit in the back of the helicopter and talk to the pilot and give really good direction on how close we are to the ground. And because the pilot can't see, there's no bubble. Like in some of the TV shows, some of those helicopters have like that, that bubble. We don't have those. So the crew chief in the back is talking the short hauler into the position they need to go to. So then I, I get on to the, wherever I need to land I unclip, I walk over to the patient and there's a series of packaging that we can do depending on the injury. And then I get them ready. And then I clip them and myself back on the bottom of that hundred foot line. And then we get flown to the nearest ambulance or the nearest point of rescue that's not on a mountain. Does that make sense? I think, I think last time you and I talked, Alicia, you had talked about a rescue off of Bigelow. Um, does that sound right? Uh, I think it, I think it was big. <laughs> I think so. I've had a few, oh, no. but not, not a ton. Um, in that one, actually, I think he was a nurse and he had already kind of self-diagnosed that he had a knee injury 
and knew he couldn't walk on it. When he called, he stated all of that. So he was prepared to be flown and knew, knew what we were doing. So we just made sure to keep his leg away from me and that, but I could also hold it so that it wouldn't end up hitting the ground. And then as we came down, the crew chief just talked us down very slowly and we were able to just land nice and easy, smooth. And then I sat him on his butt and un unclipped everything and the helicopter flew away and the ambulance came in and got him. Excellent. Um, question from Carolyn about um, ATV clubs and, you know, what kind of um, problems they might create or um, maybe just in not the clubs even, but the individuals or having that that um, activity going on in the woods. Yeah, um, I think ATV clubs and snowmobile clubs tend to really take care of their their uh, permissions. They volunteer to clear trails. They uh, most always, I think they're they're they have like a requirement or or a suggestion to make sure everybody's registered and that your spark arresters are in working order. Um, the spark arrestor is is part of what we do as a forest ranger. We don't deal a lot with snowmobile and ATV laws, but as it comes to um, spark arresters, they're coming off the muffler and they stop carbon from coming out really super hot and starting fires. So ATVs can be an issue. I've had some ATV startup start. fires, uh, but the clubs seem to be, you know, very pleased with uh, being able to have access to, to land and they do their best. Those are actually folks that tend to volunteer. So part of that littering that I talked about, we do something called Landowner Appreciation Cleanup Day in uh, conjunction with the Maine Warden Service. And we'll go in with sets of volunteers and sometimes they're ATV clubs or snowmobile clubs and they go in and they'll help clean people's land just to try to maintain that privilege of, of being on site. Is that Thank you. helpful? Okay. Yeah, that's great. Um, there's a question. Uh, did you have helicopter experience before starting short haul or did Maine train you with everything? Maine, Maine trained us with everything. Uh, we, we start by you know, your first week, they try to get you in a helicopter or your first couple of weeks, try to get you up in so you get to see your unit. Um, I, I cover most of Knox and uh, Lincoln County in, in my newer slot, they call it the area that I cover. So I remember getting up in a, in a helicopter, but I started up in Lee. So I got up in a helicopter up there pretty early on and just taking a look from the sky and it, they want to make sure you can fly because when a fire comes in, if, especially in these unorganized territories where there aren't roads everywhere, you need to get your eyes on it. You find a hell of spot, you meet the helicopter, you get up, you get in and you take a look and try to figure out your plan of action from there. So um, yeah, everything was a step-by-step -step process when it comes to helicopter. We're really, really careful with aviation because it's, it's always a risk assessment as to whether the helicopter needs to be in motion or not. Um, Nicole's asking, what are the requirements to become a forest ranger? Is there a shortage of rangers? And what do you think makes an ideal candidate? I think a sense of adventure makes you an ideal can candidate. It's, uh, it's a job where, I mean, I've been from St. Agat, St. Palmfield, to uh, down east, uh, all the way over to the New Hampshire border in what I do. It, it, not even just in short haul, just working on weather stations or over manning where we're short on rangers and I have to go up there and whatever. So if you if you're into exploration and you you like to be out in the woods, you have a you have a, a keen sense of of being able to learn, um, being open to it because the fire qualification system is just constant. You can constantly be moving forward um, or moving up. Whether you're going to be the incident commander of the the car fire out in California or you're the firefighter one who's just started and this is their first fire. You know, if depending on your abilities and your desire, you can move pretty high up. Um, that was one part of the question there. We actually are going to be hiring in summertime. I think we just hired a, a bunch more. I think we just hired six. Um, and the requirements are either um, two years of uh, associate's degree or uh, a bachelor's degree and uh, I and also, to, or, or you can have um, uh, prior experience that, that they find necessary, like GIS work, um, fire, law enforcement, um, maybe environmental protection, depending on what it is, uh, they take that all into account. But we're looking for really well-rounded individuals. I mean, you're, you're, you're working on your own, you have to be self-motivated. Every day I get in my truck, I start work. I need to plan out 
my burn permit checks, my uh, harvest inspections, um, being able to respond, making sure my equipment's tip top ready to go. Um, so really being self-motivated is a, is a big requirement. Um, then there's a, an application process. Then there's a PT test where you have to be able to run a mile and a half. Um, there's a time for each age group and uh, gender. And then you have to be able to do push-ups and sit-ups. So if you pass that physical test, then you go into an initial interview. Then you have a, a psych evaluation and a uh, polygraph test, and then uh, the kind of the final interview. So that's that's our process. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question about um, are species of trees changing with warming climates? That is not my realm. <laughs> I I think we we're seeing a lot more, especially like the Southern pine beetle. I think everybody might've seen that that's, that's become uh, an issue in the state of Maine. We thought we were five years out from that, but we're not. And they think part of that is the insects are, were able to, it was warmer longer and the wind was stronger. They think maybe they were just able to ride it a little further North this year. So I don't know about trees changing, um, but I mean, lots of things are changing. Great. Um, how much work do you do with disease pests, this is related, and their threat to our forests? And what are the current threats to main trees? So the hemlock woody adelgid, um, I wouldn't say the southern pine beetle is an issue yet. Uh, it's, it's isolated for now and they're working. So main forest service uh, forest rangers work with the entomologists. We're all within the same division. So entomology, that we have an entire division. They're amazing people. Um, the director of, or the, I don't know her title, but she's, you know, she's national, she sits on a national board for entomology. Um, so whenever we get a request or a question, we'll go out and take an initial site visit, maybe take a clipping off a tree, send it in and send it out to the, the entomologist folks if we can't help to answer. Sometimes it's, it's a matter of just like sleuthing a little bit. And did this, was this an onset, uh, a quick onset or has this been coming for a while? You know, you can kind of break it down like maybe, hey, have you sprayed fertilizer here lately? And, you know, we work we work sometimes kind of weeding out some of those those uh, issues before they go to entomology. But those folks are right on top of things. Great. There's, these are wonderful questions. Keep them yeah, coming. It's yeah. really interesting. Um, so there's a question. Would you share about your personal journey towards becoming a forest ranger? How old were you when you first got interested? OK, yeah, um, I. I actually grew up in the city of Boston, surprise. And uh, I moved up here when I was 17 and went to college and I went back for a summer and then never went back. I just, I really loved being here. Um, my family used to come up on vacation. So I, I just fell in love and I wanted to be here and I wanted to be in the outdoors. So I went to college for parks, recreation and tourism. And I really liked it. And maybe some of you folks know Al Kimball, but he was one of my professors and he was, he was amazing and he, tried to get me to stay in for my master's in forestry. So I stayed on an extra year and did a bunch of forestry classes. And then I, I decided I was done with school. I went in and taught at Job Corps up in Bangor in their outdoor, well, we I'm kind of created like a little bit of an outdoor program there, just trying to get kids engaged. Um, and I just, it wasn't outside enough for me. And I had a friend whose father had worked for the Forest Service. And I was like, that's perfect. And I had taken a, a wildland fight, firefighting like shortened class in college. I was like, yeah, why don't people, why doesn't everybody do this? Like you get to be outside and like working hard. This sounds great. So then I applied and then I got in and uh, the rest is that. I started up in Lincoln uh, Lee area and then I was there for six months or so and then came down here. I've been here ever since. And I saw one up here about what percentage of rangers are women. Um, that's math, but I'll tell you there are four of us <laughs> out of uh, 50, I think we're, what are we, I think we're 50, 52 now. Um, and it's, uh, I, I would say it's been average four for my entire career, but it's not, um, it's not for lack of, of feeling, feeling really great about being here. Like we, diversity and inclusion in here is, is, is pretty great there. Everybody's super supportive. So I, I mean, I, you just, you have to be strong because you have to be able to lift a pump and you have to be able to haul hose. But I mean, that's, that's how we're raising our young ladies right now. Be strong anyway, so. 
there <laughs> should be no uh, should be no uh, problem with that. So <laughs> the person who asked that has two young uh, Barry has two young daughters, as do I. So we both agree that we. <laughs> Yeah, me too. Isn't <laughs> pretty strong? I know, right? Pretty strong. <laughs> um, yeah, these are great questions. Let's see. Oh, um, somebody asked if you would mind showing the list of the specialties again. Um, if you could share your screen again and just bring that up, that would be really Ooh, great. And challenging. <laughs> I know the 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 it's the tech test. Sorry. Hold on. I can go backwards here. Are you seeing it right now? Yeah. Okay. That was fabulously quick. If somebody has a follow-up question, it's I can't see the chat. So if you have a follow-up question to this, please go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and ask me. I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, and actually what I can do is I can solicit Alicia for this um, list and we can include it as a Word document if you'd like us to. When We'll do a follow-up email when the... Um, recording is is completed and ready to be shared okay. so that um, and we can include this as a as a um, piece of information to accompany that email so I think I think I might have missed a couple but I think my point was that we're just so like multifaceted in this agency I think that was the point of it and I'll, I'll double check to see what I'm missing later on okay great um, so there's a question um, Somebody's son is eight years old and he'd like to know what the most common crime is that you see. And thank you. Good question. Yes. Um, most common, I would say, would be burning without a permit. People not understanding what a campfire is versus cleaning up the debris in your yard and burning it. Those are two different things. And you need a permit if you're going to be burning anything that you're not cooking or warming over. And if you are burning on a 40 degree day, and you say you're warming by it, but you're walking around and raking and throwing leaves in the fire, that's, that's the test of whether you're cooking or warming or just cleaning up your yard. So I, I would say following the permit criteria, which is not burning, uh, burning within the time limits given, burning not prohibited materials, so only things that are made of wood because cardboard has chemicals in it, particle board has chemicals in it, pressure treated wood has chemicals in it. So making sure that it's just cut split wood and that is all or clean lumber. Great. Um, there's a question from Anne. Where do you think we are with brown tail moths? I keep hoping they will eat and migrate out in a way. <laughs> That's a positive spin on it, but I have not heard that at all. Um, and I haven't heard any predictions for this spring, but if you looked up in the trees in the fall when the leaves came off, there was still quite, quite a bit of nests especially down where we are, it's significant. There's a question from Nicole. It sounds like your role is more enforcement and firefighting. What are the other divisions in the main forest service that help to manage our vast forests? Um, there's forest policy and management and they work with uh, their district foresters. So they'll work with landowners and go do a walk and talk. Uh, they'll, they'll go on your own property and and talk to you about what you have growing and some good ideas. They won't do forest or private forester work. Um, they can't really help uh, like tell you what to harvest as much. Like that's, that's the private industry, but they can come and just give you advice on, on what you have. Um, there's, uh, I feel like I'd have to look, but there's entomology, which works with uh, insects um, and prevention and education and that. And I feel like I'm missing something, oh my goodness. Um, but it's all on the ACF Department of Maine Forest Service website. But they, there's, I mean, we all collaborate, which is the cool part. We get together uh, once a year and uh, kind of just keep people apprised of what, what's going on in each division. And we cross train, which is cool. We just did one, uh, Patty Cormier is the director of the Maine Forest Service. And she started this two years ago or three, I guess, pre-COVID. And we all got together and we got to like go through some kind of exercises in entomology and, and identification. And then we showed the drone program. And um, then we, we saw some water quality complaints that the, the regional coordinators had been dealing with and getting fines from loggers that had kind of had some violations, that kind of thing, so. Great. 
um, there's a question of what is GIS? Maybe that was something on one of your lists. Yeah, it was uh, geographic information systems. So it's, it's, uh, it's any kind of information uh, gathering that you do on like a handheld lately. Like that's, that's what we use in the GIS form. So we, when you're on a fire, your job may be to go out and uh, keep track of every house on this road. Tell us if it has defensible space, like we talked about that 30 feet or not, and you would mark it with this or this. And so like, that's a, that's a kind of a dial down version, but it, it, it's just being able to use technology and mapping, if that if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. And um, there's a question: Why can you burn only after five p.m.? I assume that that's to do with that question is relevant to our online burn permit system, which now is free. Uh, we initially hadn't hadn't wanted to charge at all, but the state needed to recoup some costs for for something I, I can't remember, so I shouldn't speak about it. But we had to charge to pay, I think, for the for the website itself. Um, and at that point, the blanket permit was for after 5 p.m. because it has to do with volunteer firefighters. So if you have volunteer firefighters in your community, they are working. So they work, let's say, nine to five. So they limit the burn permits until after five o'clock when hopefully those folks are home and are able to respond. There are volunteer firefighters that respond while they're working and they have the good graces of their uh, bosses to be able to leave and go take care of something and come back. But to, to make sure that towns are the safest they can be, we put that in there as the guideline, but any fire chief or town warden can go in and change it and make it whatever they want. It can be no time restrict restrictions. It can be three o'clock in the afternoon, anything like that. All right. There's a participant with a son with a single track mind. Now his <laughs> son would like to know what is the most nastiest crime you have ever seen? Oh, like egregious would be thousands of dollars being basically stolen from elderly folks uh, by not paying them for the wood that was taken from their property. Grossest would be rotting garbage that I'm not going to describe. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> oh, yeah, this, this is great questions. Um, and he says, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Good. We've covered a lot of territory here. I don't know if we covered everything you do, but we covered a lot of territory. And um, that was great. Are there any other um, questions that are still out there? Um, oh, my, my about, colleague. Oh, go ahead, Susan. I, I'm just thinking, like, wh what about animals? Do you interact a lot with animals or have what, what are your responsibilities towards animals in the forest? Uh, so the warden service deals with all hunting or injured animals. Uh, we, I look at them and think they're pretty um, and kind of look for good hunting spots, I guess, while I'm working. But that's, that's about it. We don't. Uh, we don't deal with with uh, animals at all. My colleague asks, um, "Have you ever felt in danger?" I would I would say some fires uh, really give you the hair on the back of your neck standing up kind of feeling, um, and so do some interactions. But you know, just being able to always make sure I'm taking the the correct safety precautions and all of that, knowing where my safety zones are, and and uh, being aware of of my entire scene and setting, so. There's a question about um, some forest rangers work with national forests and monuments. And I think she's asking, do you work with national forests oh. and monuments? So we, we're a year round. Uh, we don't do trail maintenance, not the parks, uh, the, the uh, parks and lands. Those folks hire seasonal folks that do the trail maintenance. We actually do work in partnership with some of the state parks for burning. Uh, we've done some prescribed burning it with Mount Blue and then some like Rome. If you've ever been to Rome in the blueberry field up the, up the top of the hill, we've burned that. Um, we're looking at some other state um, other state properties. Um, and those are uh, parks and lands through the biology department as well. So we work with those folks, but we don't do trail maintenance, but we do, we will hike trails to make sure there are no illegal campsites, no illegal campfires anywhere. Um, because that's private property or it's, it's public property, but there's no, no illegal camping and no illegal fires without written permission. 
great. Um, there's a question. Do you cover the entire state of Maine? And follow up to that, have any of your crew traveled to the Western fires this past year? Yeah, we, we were out. Our engines were out from, I think it was late February, early March. Yeah, it was March, March until uh, I think end of October. Um, full rotations uh, for our engine crew mostly. We, yeah, we, it was just engine crews that we sent out um, aside from ours, our short IMT team, that incident management team, and then um, some individual resources that go out as task force leaders, which is being in charge of like a group of like uh, firefighters and engines, and you're coordinating them on the section of fire that you're working on. So we did, uh, we did have people out all year. And we do, yes, Maine, Maine Forest Rangers cover the entire state. So like I said, I, I cover, we've kind of switched. So we all uh, overlap at times, depending on our schedules. But initially I used to have, again, most of Knox and part of Lincoln County, that was my patrol area. So then there's me all over the state. Um, there's a question, do you use, do forest rangers ever use horses? No, no, <laughs> no, we use ATVs and UTVs and uh, that would be pretty cool, but no, we do not. <laughs> I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Um, all right, and then there's a question, um, is it considered a ha uh, hazard duty and is does your pay reflect that? Uh, not right now, uh, we, no. No, we get overtime when we're, because we'll work 16 hour shifts on a fire. So we'll get overtime for anything over what we're scheduled to work that day, either an eight or a 10. So that's that part. So do you staff Baxter State Park and other state parks? No, uh, those are, so the Baxter State Park Rangers are their own entity. They are separate than other state park rangers. And uh, because they're under the grant from uh, Baxter and, and they have their own, um, their whole entire own crew. The other state parks, um, are individually hired seasonally or full-time. Great. There's a question about, um, let's see, how much prescribed burning do you do a year? Also, um, this person worked as on a fire in Montana with guys this summer. It's nice to see Maine represented out West, he says. Awesome. Um, the Prescribed burning is something that's really kind of coming back and we're really pushing, pushing to, to talk about it with the community, with the public. Uh, I, I'm the member at large for the Maine uh, Prescribed Burn Council. We were established, I think it's three years ago now. Um, we're trying to get our feet underneath us with uh, some memorandums of understanding with different agencies, uh, Nature Conservancy, IFNW, us, and, and National Park Service. And so once that's kind of done, hopefully we'll be able to move pieces around and do a lot more burning um, cooperatively. Um, I think right now it's just those folks that are willing to reach out and say, hey, can you write me a burn plan? And so I'll sit down and write a burn plan for that area to include smoke management, um, all the abutting landowners, uh, the methods, the, pres uh, the prescription for the weather. Um, what conditions we're going to need to get what we want to happen, and then making sure that we have that acceptable parameter uh, for, for, for keeping things safe. So not as much as we'd like to see. We'd like to see some, a lot more prescribed burning because it's, it's a wildfire hazardous reduction, hazard reduction, and it helps habitats and it brings back agricultural fields. I mean, it has, it has a plethora of uses. Great. Um, there's a question about, are you under U.S. government or local? We, we are state, state government. We work for the state of Maine and our recruitment, we're, we're always looking. So if you know anybody who's like wavering and they love to go out and see the world, but they're not really sure what they want to do and they're really smart and they like adventure, like throw them our way, see if, see if we can, you can do ride-alongs. We, if you have somebody interested, they can get in the truck with me and go check a couple harvests, a burn permit, walk a piece of property, kind of talk about the job. That's always an opportunity. And I'll put my email address in the chat box. So if anybody is interested in that, um, they can just email me. And uh, if it's not me, another ranger in my district would be happy to take you along and 
show you how we do things. That was great. That's great. Um, all right. Oh, so one, again, um, if you could just tell us what the qualifications are to become a forest uh, ranger, I think you. Yeah, we talked about it a little bit. Um, just making sure you have education that's uh, either equal to an associate's degree or you have an associate's degree and or uh, experience that kind of fits in the mold of what a forest ranger does and is. So if you've worked out West on a fire crew for three, four years, like you'd have the experience to be able to apply even if you don't have a college degree because anybody can learn in a job. Most, most jobs you can learn as you go, so. Great. Do you do demos ever at local school systems? Some, yeah, I'm doing a uh, recruitment uh, job fair virtually next month. And when asked, we go out and present at local high schools. And, and uh, we still do Smokey for the young folks. We bring them into elementary schools and talk about fire prevention. <laughs> All right, next time you're in the Smokey, you'd outfit I would like a photograph that would be great I don't wear it I stand next to Smokey so <laughs> you got to get a volunteer for that job <laughs> you guys have seen us at the pumpkin parade actually this I, I never seem to be working that day and I'm always bird hunting or something so I've missed the, the last two but we've been out there a few times that's a great parade to see some nice. Smokey. yeah good well it's been a wonderful hour. Thank you very much, Alicia. I really appreciate all of your um, hard work and what you do for Maine Forests and entertaining us with really great information and stories. It's been really fun. Great. So thank you everyone for joining us. We'll send you a email with- one other question. I'm sorry oh, to interrupt. No, that's quite all right. Go right ahead. What? We're here. Alicia, what is the chance you think that we'll ever have another fire like they did in 49. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that is something we talk about all the time because that's what you need to be prepared for. Um, I think things are so very different. So we all study that. Um, that's part of like, that's part of moving on as a forest ranger. You have to study why it happened and how it happened. And there was significant wind and there was significant uh, drought and, uh, and fuels that were continuous, but there weren't local volunteer fire departments that were organized. There was no incident management that happened. So in that regard, we've taken some huge steps to fix some of those pitfalls. But I mean, it's, it's, it's earth, it's, it's, it's nature. She's, she's gonna do what she's gonna do. We just hope that we're prepared the best we can be. And we are more populated too, yeah. which means more people that could potentially start fires more damage if a fire happens. Yeah, I, I think we have really, we don't have a, a lot of fire starts that are intentional. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's folks that don't put their fires out. They think they're out because they're smoldering and they're just smoking, there's no visible flame and people don't put enough water and they don't stir it up and they don't drown it and they don't stick their hand down the middle of it. And I think that's, that's one of our biggest issues, the fire speaking you just said something that made me want to ask another question so i was shocked to find out that they claim that most of the fires in california i think are intentionally started i haven't Is seen that statistics on that i i know that a lot of them are caused by png and you know a lot of them are mechanical because they're so dry everything's tinder out there so if a car backfires or anything happens like they'll just or something hot falls off a car just uh -huh. then you've lost it but I don't know the answer to that I haven't I haven't seen that okay thank you you're welcome there's a, a a kind question do you get more of a break in the winter months Alicia no because I'm doing this and I'm doing trainings <laughs> I, and I, I prefer to be outside in the winter. I love the winter, but we, we tend to just be really uh, training heavy and, and uh, trying to, again, think about equipment for the future. Cause we've had years where the fire season starts. I had a fire in January once I, it's happened a few times. And, you know, you might start in early March, you might start end of April, depending on what we're given for weather and drought conditions prior to. Thankfully this year we ended with quite a bit of moisture 
Um, so those drought conditions that we started with last year should not be a problem, but we'll see. All right, we will send you an email with the link to this recorded uh, program. So if you would like to share it with uh, folks you know, especially maybe people who are interested in going into the Forest Service and learning more about it. Um, and we really appreciate you all joining us. So thanks very much and have a nice evening, everyone. Take thanks care. For listening. Thanks, Sarah. Thank, Thank you. you.